Good morning and welcome to worship. Welcome to those gathered here, to those joining with us through our Eastlink broadcast and those who are joining us online. Welcome one and all. It is good to be here today to worship God and hear God's word together. We have announcements as we do and I'll go through them and we'll start with our meetings and upcoming events three on three successive nights this week two starting at 7 p.m. that's finance on Tuesday at 7 p.m. and our deacons meeting on Wednesday at 7 p.m. and then is it handbills at 7? 6.15 that's what I thought and on Thursday will be our handbell practice at 6.15 getting ready for the uh, upcoming next uh, Sunday's Advent service in Dutton, carol service. Followed by choir. <laughs> and here's Neil. He's had a good trip. Don't ask him about the food in Cuba. <laughs> but we're glad that you had a good time and glad that you have had safe travels. Welcome back. And then for Friday this week, our clubs B and B minus, and you may have noticed that that is the special prayer request, if I can put it that way this week. So continue to pray for our clubs B and B minus and leaders and young people with the men's breakfast the next morning at 8 a.m. And I really do love the bacon, so you've got to come, but you have to let Tim know so that numbers can be counted. That's at 8 a.m. And thanks as well to all who do serve in the ways we have just announced. Lastly, we are collecting donations during the month of December for the corner cupboard. And I know that you've been through this before, but this is, this is new for me. And there are uh, suggestions listed in your bulletins. There's quite a list there. So you may be familiar with all those things, but just run through the list again. And we do want to thank you for your support and for donations. So let us remember all of these things that we have announced and talked about in prayer before God as we take time for quiet music and for quiet prayer. have chosen three readings from the Revelation to John, the last book of the Bible, this morning. And the first is our responsive call to worship, the Revelation to John, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Kingdom, priest serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and on his account all the tribes of the earth will wail. 
so it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let us worship God. Come Christians, join to sing. Number 87 in your books. The words are on the screen. If you'll stand and join me if you're able. Let us pray. We gather with glad hearts, O God, in Christ, in praise of you, and we gather with petitions and hopes and dreams, our hearts open to your word. By your loving spirit, direct our energies that your will may be done as we catch a glimpse of the work you have given us to do, and make us truly grateful and thankful for that privilege in and through the precious name of Jesus Christ, and for his sake. Amen. The first scripture reading after our responsive reading this morning is Psalm 93. The Lord is king. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed. He is girded with strength. He has established the world. It shall never be moved. Your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. The floods have lifted up, O Lord. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their roaring. More majestic than the thunders of mighty waters. More majestic than the waves of the sea. Majestic on high is the Lord. Your decrees are very sure. Holiness befits your house, O Lord, forevermore. Sing um, two short choruses this morning to start. Um, awesome God, number 658, and then I will call upon the Lord, number 653. Uh, remember that I will call upon the Lord is a call and response. So I will start and you will echo, hopefully. If you'll stand and join me. <clears throat>
Let us pray. We have many thanks to bring to you this morning, Almighty God. We do thank you for that song of praise and for the gift of your salvation through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But we thank you too as well, simply for the mystery of our existence. We thank you that we are here at all. And we recognize that you have set into motion a wonderful dance of life in our world and doubtless on countless others. And so we want to give thanks for that today as well. And to give thanks for what we can see and what we cannot see. Whether particles we can only guess at or stars and worlds that yet undiscovered. We thank you as well, O oh God, for the wonder of perception, for the fact that we can see and hear and touch and taste all of the things of this wonderful and awe-inspiring creation you've given to us. We pray that you would help us to not walk through your wonders without praising or even acknowledging what a wonder it is to be here. And so we thank you for the continuing revelation of your glory and the unfolding of history. We thank you for the creation and the recreation of seasons and settings alike and unique, ever-changing yet reassuring, revealing that you do not change. O Lamb who sits upon the throne about whom all things revolve and who also makes all things new, to you be all the praise and all the glory. Now we pray for ourselves and for others. We pray for all who fail to see your glory. In precious little ones such as we have newly welcomed into our congregation. And in our seniors, in youth and in maturity and in all life. We pray for all who cannot see your story unfolding in lives all around and in those around the world. We also pray for ourselves as we pray for those who do not hear the song worthy is the lamb that is raised in praise around God's throne by those who have lived and all who are loved echoed in the gentle falling of the rain this past week or the snow as well as in the waves of a lake pounding the shore We pray for those who will not hear that you are present in the universe and all will be well. And last of all, we pray once again for ourselves and others. Bless us all, O God, and open our ears and our eyes and our hearts to the miracle that surrounds us every single day and to the wonder that accompanies us in every single moment of our lives. All of these things we pray in the mighty name of the Lamb of God, who bears the marks of slaughter and wears the wounds of glory. Joining in the prayer which we have been taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in glory. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Last Sunday we sang, Give thanks with a grateful heart. Give thanks to the Holy One. Give thanks because God's given Jesus Christ. God's Son. And then the song went on, And now let the weak say, I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what the Lord has done for us. And give thanks. So let us bless God as the ushers come forward to receive our tithes and offerings. Let us pray. 
God, whose giving knows no ending, we bless you and thank you for everything you have done for us. And with the giving of our offerings and our lives, we ask to be made more of what you intend for us as your people and your church. In turn, may we be a blessing, your comfort and your joy, where there is want and struggle, until at last the world is remade. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.
readings from Revelation. The first is chapter 5, verse 8 to 14. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the Lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayer of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God saints from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and the elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice, Worthy is the Lamb that was slaughtered to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing. To the one seated on the throne and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living, cre living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. And from Revelation 7, verses 13 to 19. Then one of the elders addressed me, saying, Who are these robed in white, and where have they come from? I said to him, Sir, you are the one that knows. Then he said to me, These are they who have come out of the great ordeal. They have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. For this reason, they are before the throne of God and worship him day and night within his temple. And the one who is seated on the throne will shelter them. They will hunger no more and thirst no more. The sun will not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of the water of life, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. As we prepare for the message, we're going to sing two more. I invite you to stay seated as we sing through these two verses. Number 102, His Name is Wonderful. And number 472, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus. As Anne read in the end, the revelation to John chapter 5 says, 
there may be myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands <coughs> surrounding the throne. So let me set our message on the real truth about the final destination of the world up with a story. I was watching a documentary on the Vietnam War the other day and as part of that documentary <coughs> an American who had been a prisoner of war, a POW, was talking about how he had survived that ordeal, eventually returning home to become a doctor. And he talked about having to walk, I think it was more than 800 kilometers, it was a long ways, north up the Ho Chi Minh Trail on a starvation rations, repairing the trail along the way, burying 14 of his fellow POWs en route to the infamous Hanoi Hilton a prison, as you're probably aware, in the city of Hanoi where American POWs, like the famous Senator John McCain, were systematically tortured. And as he told his story, it became clear that one of the things that enabled this gentleman to survive was his vision of returning home to a wonderful welcome, a reunion with his mother and father and siblings and his faith in that future. And in his mind's eye, he could see, if you will, a picture of that end to his ordeal, even though he had no idea when that might be. And that's what kept him going. Now the scripture passages we read earlier from the book of the Revelation to John give us a picture or more accurately an inspired vision of where we are going as human beings, as we said right off the top, the goal of human history. And we may think of that in at least two ways. We may see the end as simply the conclusion or the termination of the matter. As Bernard W. Anderson has put it, like any drama, the biblical drama has a beginning, a climax, or denouement, and an end. So here in the last book of the Bible we may think of the vision of heaven we have been given in that sense. While we may also think about the end as more than just the conclusion of the matter. We may see these beautiful and poetic visions the revelation to John gives us as revealing the purpose of the drama of the Bible and of our lives as they have been unfolding. And though we may not have seen that point or purpose or that goal toward which we have been moving very clearly along the way, at last it becomes clear. When all is said and done, says the book of Revelation, we are going to be forever with God. We are going to be with God and God is going to be completely with us in a new heaven and a new earth. That's the way I read the revelation to John summing it up. And it is a glorious vision. In the end, the purposes of God shall be fulfilled and God shall rule. God shall get exactly what God wants. As Bernard W. Anderson has put it once again, the Bible affirms that our lives are part of a great drama that moves in the direction of a goal. All things, history and nature, heaven and earth, are caught up in the purpose of the God who is the first and the last, the Alpha and the Omega, that was our first reading. Therefore, Telling the time is not just a chronological reckoning by clocks and calendars. It is the ability to know the content of the times and to discern that our times are in God's hand, embraced within the divine sovereign purpose. A very strong statement. More specifically, and once again, the vision that the revelation to John chapters 5 and 7 gives of the end or that goal toward which we are moving is that of a great multitude surrounding the throne of the Lamb. 
And I think that is a wonderful vision for us to focus upon this last Sunday of the church here, the Sunday before Advent begins. Heaven is that time and that place where the purposes of God shall be fulfilled and we shall all be embraced within that divine sovereign purpose. God shall get what God wants no matter how hard we may have been trying to get what we want. That's the way the revelation to John seems to sum it all up. But before we get too far ahead of ourselves, there's the matter of what sort of a difference such a vision of the end might make. I have always liked C.S. Lewis's assertion that more than just believers in pie in the sky by and by, it is those who have had a hope of heaven who have done the most right here and right now on earth. That hope has been their motivation. And in a similar vein, Yvonne gave me a frame saying by Dale Carnegie, I keep on the wall of my office, which reads, most of the important things in the world have been accomplished by people who have kept trying when there seemed to be no hope at all. So in a message on how the last book of the Bible gives us the vision of a hope or of a heaven, where we shall all be with God in the end and God shall be all things to us. What a great hope. Let us remember that the revelation to John says that's the goal toward which we are moving. Let us take just a moment to consider what sort of a difference our Christian hope makes for us. I think it is interesting how we don't seem to talk too much about these things these days. Or maybe I should amend that to say that pastors and preachers don't talk about these things very often on Sunday mornings. We may leave talk of things pertaining to the end to books like the ones we have on our shelves in the church library in the foyer. You can see it right out there when you go through that door to the right. Heaven is for real tells the story of a little boy's trip to heaven and back. And we may skirt around things like that because we may wonder how people will react. Or maybe we just skirt around it because I suppose we could say on another level we know that Jesus cautioned us about spending too much time trying to figure out when this world as it is may end and the new world begins. It's easy to get caught up in that. That's why I find it helpful to think of these things in terms of putting the hope you have to work right here and right now. However, there may be other reasons why people are reluctant to focus upon visions of the end like the one given to us in the Revelation to John. And it's not just the poetry of the book. A lot of people are fairly well fixed and have the future fairly well in hand, so why bother? And of course, some people are not so much reluctant to focus upon our Christian hope as they may be just too busy. George R. Hunter the third, has said that one of the distinguishing marks of people in the 21st century is their focus upon life before death. Of course... The Revelation to John is just talking about something in the far off distant future. While in a somewhat more critical vein, and I mean critical in a positive sense, Dr. Jessica Houghton Wilson has said that much of Western society today, you may or may not agree with her, is more concerned with entertainment than eternity. Side note, a friend bought a 43-inch TV for $299 just this last Black Friday and told me I should preach on commercialism today. <laughs> Most needed in current culture, Houghton Wilson has stated, is a long-term vision that does more than react to daily headlines. And the book of the Revelation to John certainly does seem to be concerned with the longer term or the longer range vision or goal to which we are all headed. As well as being about 
responding to the realities of our lives in the light of that goal or vision. I don't want to delve into the context of the last book of the Bible other than to say that it was addressed initially to Christians who were in the vast minority undergoing persecution at the hands of the Roman Emperor Domitian in the latter half of the first century. So even though that may not apply to us precisely, let us not overlook the significance of a longer term vision like the one that John gives here in our own situation in the 21st century. So for example, let us try to see all of this from the perspective of the person whose daily reality can consist in things like hunger and malnutrition as they watch children starve to death. As a boy growing up in India, I appreciated how my father grew ragi, which was a, a very fine black millet. You could make cereal out of it that was rich in iron. It tasted awful, but it was good for you and tried to convince others to help themselves to it. While for years my mother ran three vegetable gardens in an attempt to make sure the boys in a hostel run by a local church were properly fed and might learn the value of growing their own vegetables. I would help in watering those gardens and feeding the chickens dad raised. We got the eggs right from the start. It was kind of cool. But a little thing. And as a boy, I certainly wasn't tying what I was doing to that vision of the end where there will be no more hunger and no more thirst and no more global warming with God wiping every tear away and God's justice at last prevailing. So let me just hold that vision out before you this morning. Some people just can't wait. Picking up on that and coming at it from another angle, I have had individuals approach me with the idea that the here and the now is all there is. The world is God intended it to be. And so they'll say things like, hey, you've got a direct line to the man. It's always a man upstairs to the Almighty and then in a different tone tell me how you reconcile a belief in a just and loving God with that natural disaster over there that bombing over there and this shooting over here that sort of thing the assumption being that God has planned everything just the way it happens and that's what Christians believe so I say to them, do you have an hour or two to spare? Let's sit down and read the last book of the Bible, the revelation to John, God's vision of where it's all headed. And let's lay that alongside what's been happening and then revisit your question. Well, actually, I don't, I don't say that. <clears throat> but I probably should. Being a Christian doesn't just mean that I believe that everything that happens within the overarching and unfolding purposes of Almighty God has occurred just because that's the way God told it to be. In his wonderful series of messages on the opening chapters of the Bible in the book of Genesis, a series entitled How the World Began, Helmut Thielicke emphasizes that the Bible is not so much about where we have come from as it is about where we are going. I don't want to be too repetitious, but he talks about how people can get caught up in the opening chapters of Genesis in the creation versus evolution debate perhaps, or in how we botched God's good and well-blessed creation, not living up to divine expectations with our sin and our rebellion. Well, what we should do is read on and be more concerned with that which follows. The rest of the Bible, all 66 books, tell the story of how God is the chief actor in the drama that is unfolding and how, how God has been seeking in his loving purposes toward that end of a botched creation made new, remade. 
to that vision of the end, a new heaven and a new earth given to us in the Revelation to John, the very last of the 66 books of the Bible. That's the vision with which the Revelation to John concludes the Bible. And the thing with which we are to be most concerned as Christians. So I find it helpful once again to see the things that God has not intended to happen in our world within that overarching story of God's loving purposes and the way things are intended to be in the end. Moreover, that is the job of the church. It is our task to keep the vision of a world set right and the creation fulfilled in the forefront of our own planning as well as before others and that's no easy task. Not everybody wants to be thinking about there may existing a tension or a gap between the world as we have made it and heaven as the world as almighty God has created it. Nor may one, many want to have all the hard work that we do put in that sort of a perspective. And yet here in the end we have arrived at a vision wherein heaven is that time and that place where God has become all things to all people. And where the Lamb who sits on the throne, the one who has been slain or crucified and raised from the dead, is given all the praise and all the glory and shall rule. And once again, that's quite a vision of the end. So let us not lose sight of that and of what God has done, is doing, and will do. And in that regard, a closing story, <coughs> the longest funeral I have ever attended was one in which no less than four eulogies or tributes to the deceased were given, followed by three or four hymns, a full-length message extolling the virtues of the deceased, special music and prayers. And it was a wonderful service, though long. And though the tributes to the deceased were well deserved, after the service another colleague, who had also been there, wondered whether the deceased had been fully remembered or memorialized. It was a theological point well taken. In the church, let us never lose sight of how those myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands of which the revelation to John speaks points to how all sorts of wonderful saints and remarkable sinners are gathered around the throne of the Lamb in the end. Ultimately, the loving nature and work of God and Jesus Christ is our greatest hope. I hate to have to admit it, but I almost thought I shouldn't say that this morning. But in the end, if we just talk about the purposes of God fulfilled, and justice prevailing without getting specific about how the revelation to John, the Bible, does talk about salvation belonging to God and God's Christ. I suppose an argument could be made that we should just refer to the self-help section in one of our local bookstores. Now that may be overstating it. But what does one say to someone who may not have been the very best sort of person and whose failures has led to various twists and turns throughout their life and feels like they have come right up against it with nowhere to turn. What does one say to such a person? 
That's when we turn to the book of the Revelation to John chapters and talk about the hope and the heaven, the vision that the Bible talks about. In the end, says the Revelation to John, it is God who rules and brings God's once botched creation and all the sinners and all the saints alike within that creation home. In the end, it's about God and it's about that. Amen. Crown him with many crowns, number 317, if you'll stand, if you're able, and join me. the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.